Okay, as I can see in the Bella, other sessions have started, so let's do that as well. Um, good morning, everyone. Kia ora. Um, good evening, good afternoon, all over the world. Um, welcome to the third day of I the IEEE VR 2022 conference um, and the first block of paper sessions. Um, this is a paper session on haptics, and we have six awesome papers with um, six awesome researchers that will present their work today, uh, all about haptics in mixed reality. And uh, without wasting further time and leaving plenty of time for discussions after the presentation, so I hope that you all will post questions on the Discord channel. Um, I will pass the floor to the first speaker on tapping with a handheld stick in VR redirection detection thresholds for passive haptic feedback. And the speaker is going to be Yuji Zhu. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and start. So hi everyone, I'm Ichi Zhou from Purdue University and today I'm gonna show you our work on redirected tapping. So the problem is well known, the user should not just see the virtual world, but also be able to touch it. Uh, here user's virtual hand moves, uh, goes through the wall, which is quite confusing. Of course, simply stopping the virtual hand doesn't help much. The user can tell their real hand keeps moving and doesn't touch anything. So one solution is to rely on a physical object to provide happy feedback to the user. Here, a real world happens to be aligned with the virtual world, so the user gets adequate happy feedback. Since the real and virtual worlds are different, the opportunities for ha passive happy feedback are far and few in between. And one solution is redirection. Just like in redirected walking, one can manipulate the virtual world to locally align virtual and real objects. Redirection creates more haptic feedback opportunities. Here, the user's virtual hand uh, is pushed forward to touch the virtual world while its real hand is touching the real world. One, impor one important question is how much haptic redirection can we get away with? Well, not all that much. You cannot stretch the user's virtual arm too far, like one meter away. Also, the user is pretty good at tracking their real hand without seeing it. For example, I can touch my nose with my eyes closed. Furthermore, when we touch a surface, we notice surface properties like temperature and smoothness. It's weird to touch a smooth real table while seeing a rough virtual table. So all properties should match, not only the hand positions. Our idea is to decrease the user's perceptual acuity to increase the amount of redirection that is not noticeable. The user should use a stick to feel the virtual world. We have developed two haptic redirection methods. One is called drifting hand. It pushes the virtual hand and stick forward or backward to bridge the gap between the real and virtual objects. Here, the real and stick and uh, hand show in red for illustration, and the user doesn't see those. The whole process starts at A, and the synchronized contact is made at C. The epsilon value is the distance between the virtual and real objects. When it's negative, the virtual object is farther than the real object, and vice versa. Uh, our second method stretches or shrinks the virtual stick instead of moving the virtual hand and stick to synchronize content. It's called very stick. And you can notice here the, the real hand and virtual hand always stays the same at the same location. We conducted a user study to see what distances between real and virtual objects can be bridged without the user noticing. 
we use the two AFC design as recommended by psychophysical research. Uh, this task is to tap two spheres in succession, one with redirection and one without redirection. The user has to choose the one where, where they think there was redirection. And here's a video of the task, tapping task. And for the very stick method, the question is for which sphere did the virtual stick change in length? And the user has to answer this question after each trial. If they're not sure about which sphere did the virtual stick change in length, they have to randomly pick one. And it, as you can see, it's not always easy to tell. For the drifting hand method, the question is for which sphere did your virtual hand not move as expected? And you, as you can see here, the virtual hand moves much more than the real hand. So it's pretty obvious to choose the right one. And in this case, it's very hard to tell which one is the correct one or which one to choose. We have 24 conditions in total. So four stick length times three wall distances times two methods. So a wall distance is the distance between a virtual wall and the real wall, which is the whiteboard in this case. And the zero centimeters is the default wall position. For each condition, the user performed 27 pairs of tasks, repeating three times each of the nine real to virtual distances which is the epsilon value I said before. We fitted two detection threshold for each condition, one for when the real object is closer than the virtual object and one for the other case. A threshold is found by feeding a sigmoid psychometric function through the answer correctness uh, data. The chance performance is 50% correct and detection threshold is measured at 75% correct rate. Here you see the eight graphs, each with two thresholds that correspond to the default wall position. Overall, the very stake provided larger detection threshold than drifting hand. This is expected as the user is more sensitive to the manipulation of their hand positions. And that's my presentation and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, like in the other sessions, um, we will actually do the uh, questions at the end of the session. So we okay. will first have all presentations and then collect the questions on Discord. And then I will moderate the discussion session afterwards. So okay. thank you again for the presentation. Um, yeah. And I would like now to pass on immediately to the second presentation here, which is on STRO, an underground string-based weight simulation device, um, a paper by Alexander Achberger, Piri, Pira Tipian Aulja, Kresimir Vidakovic, Michael Seilomay, and the presenter is going to be Alexander Achberger. Yeah, so thank you. So I'm a PhD student of the University of Stuttgart, and I'm doing my PhD at Mercedes-Benz. And today I want to show you a new um, um, weight simulation device. So I hope you enjoy. Your reality gives users the ability to experience the virtual environments more immersively and to act with them more realistically. Nowadays, VR users do not feel the weight of virtual objects, which can result in a less realistic and immersive experience. Current weight simulation devices have shown that interacting with virtual objects can feel more realistic. For example, there are weight illusion devices, propeller-based devices, liquid-based devices, electrical muscle stimulation approaches, body-grounded devices, or grounded devices. However, these devices have some limitations such as high latency, disturbing sound, weak forces, limited mobility, or they are uncomfortable. Towards addressing these challenges, we propose to do a new ungrounded string-based weight simulation device that is worn as an add-on to a shoe. 
Strew can be used mobile via battery pack and all electronic components are included into the device. To generate a weight simulation, Strew can use a brushless DC motor that pulls a string that is attached to the user's controller. Additionally, Strew has a stepper motor that can position the movable wheel. Strew can simulate weights up to 720 grams. One major challenge was to generate forces downwards independent of the user's body movement. Because we are only using one string, the string has always to be directed downward. To achieve this, the pulley can be moved in two degrees of freedom. It uses the stepper motor to move the wheel forwards and backwards. A bearing is responsible for the left and right movement of the wheel. Through the string tension, the bearing rotates automatically when the users move the controller. To determine where to position the pulley, we attach an ATC Vive tracker to the user's foot and measure the distance between the foot and the user's controller. Depending on the distance, the stepper motor positions the wheel under the user's controller. Thus, the user can feel downward forces independent of the user's movement. The design of Strew allows the user to perceive the weight during walking. Participants describe the weight simulation during walking as realistic. In our technical evaluation, we measured a maximum force Strew can generate. We increased the current of the motor linearly and measured a maximum force of 7.2 Newton. Additionally, we measured Stu's latency and consistency over 10 seconds at 50% and 100% current. Results show a latency of 250 milliseconds for force generation for each current level and 200 and 250 milliseconds for stopping weight simulation. The measured consistency was about 0.02 Newton at 50% current and 0.2 Newton at 100% current. We also measure the force during walking. Results show pattern for each step and we measured an average derivation of 0.53 Newton. We conducted a proof of concept study in order to evaluate the potential of Strew and its performance in different scenarios. We have implemented four different VR scenarios and varied them on how much they have to walk to evaluate Strew's limits regarding free walking. In the first scenario, the participants have to sort five equal looking cubes by their different weights. We choose this scenario to investigate how well Strew can offer various weight simulations. In this scenario, participants usually do not move their feet or only a few small steps. In this scenario, the participants had to catch objects with a small container and throw them into a chest. Here, Strew simulates the weight of the container and the weight of the caught object while it lies in the container. This scenario requires quick upper body movement but is mostly stationary. Here participants need to place different blocks on a small platform without knocking the other items down. The shape, size and weight of the objects are different. The weights of the objects were between 180 grams and 730 grams. The items are placed on tables next to the platform so participants have to move around a lot while holding the items. This scenario is about tidying up a room. The participants have to grab objects on the desk and position them in the designated place. Here the participants have to walk the most. In our study we choose two conditions, the visual only condition and the visual haptic condition using Strew. Besides quantitative task performance, we measure the user experience and the haptic experience on a 5-point Likert scale. For the user experience, we ask for fun, realism and immersion. The haptic experience questions were about consistency, saliency, realism and harmony. In total, we had 12 participants. In the overall experience, we can see that on average, the participants had more fun and perceived the VR scenarios with Strew more realistically and immersively. The highest increase were in realism. We noticed that perceived fun decreased with the scenario order, which we assume also depends on the amount the participants had to walk. Overall, we were satisfied with the results of the haptic experience questions, which shows a potential in the technical aspects of Strew. On average, the restriction was rate is the lowest with 3.5, where 5 means no restriction in your movement and 1 means very high restriction. The restriction ratings increase depending on the scenario. 
The participants felt less restricted when they had a more static scenario and more restricted if they had to walk a lot. However, the realism during walking was rated high. We observed some limitations about Strew. It cannot simulate the center of mass. Participants mentioned a restriction in their free walking. Additionally, the speed of the movable pulley is slow and using two strokes at the same time can cause some collisions in their rods. Overall, Strew increased the participants' perceived fun, realism and immersion in the VR scenarios. In future, we want to improve its wearing comfort and ergonomic design and conduct an expert study to measure how suitable it is for industrial use cases. More details can be found in our paper. So, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Alexander. Um, this brings us to the third paper in this session. Um, and the title of that paper is Level at SR, a Substitutional Reality Level Design Workflow. And it's a paper by Lee Beaver and Nigel John. And Lee um, is going to present the paper. It's your floor, Lee. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Lee Beaver, and this is my talk, Level at SR, a Substitutional Reality Level Design Workflow. So what is substitutional reality? Well, the term substitutional reality is used to describe systems or experiences that integrate physical real world objects, so something like a table or a desk, into a fully virtual environment with varying levels of accuracy. So the user in VR could see something completely different, but they can still touch the object. So what are the benefits of SR? Well, one is you gain passive haptics. So it gives players tactile feedback. So if they see a chair, they can go to it, they can touch it and they can sit in it. Uh, it also allows for more flexible play spaces. So um, spaces that wouldn't normally be suitable for room scale VR, so like a bedroom because the bed takes up a lot of space. Because we know where those objects are in those spaces, then we can make full use of the environment. So the problem, well, devices and software essentially need to have a spatial understanding of the space. So we effectively need a virtual 3D map of the space, a way to register it, so both virtual and real world action actual. Now this could be done with cameras and sensors, but depending on the device, it could be quite expensive and um, resource intensive as well. And there's no, there's no kind of agreed on workflow and how to achieve this yet either, um, particularly if the system wants to support user-generated content. So we developed Level SR, which allows users to create their own substitution reality game levels. So in this demo here, you can see uh, we're playing a sample game, which is a target shooting game. So you can see the real-world objects are mapped to the virtual objects. So you can see using a wardrobe, but to the user in the uh, VR, they see it as an Egyptian style tablet and they're using it for cover. So we developed the workflow to uh, work on consumer devices. So we developed a smartphone application that uses two different techniques. Um, the one on the left is meshing, and this uses the LiDAR sensor on an iPad or an iPhone. And essentially the user can move around and create a mesh of the space. Um, and then on the right is the outline technique. And so this doesn't use a LiDAR sensor, so it works on many more de um, devices. So the user set effectively in this one goes around, they mark out the outline of the object uh, and then the height and, and whatnot. So we get the position of it, uh, the general shape and the size of it. We then need to mark the controller locations in the virtual world. And then when we go into VR, we can place our controllers in those locations and that allows us to sync up the virtual world map and the real world. So once we've got that map, we can then decide how we want to use it. So in this case, we're just using it as a template. And so we're just creating some game objects using the procedural creating uh, creation tools. Alternatively, we could just replace it with um, a pre-existing uh, pre model. So in this case, some sort of tomb. If we're happy with the data we've got, we can actually just convert them into game objects and then we can just decorate them so that they suit the environment a little bit better. Once in, the player can then start to create their level using um, a whole suite of editing tools. So they can create procedural shapes, they can place models into the scene, they can um, edit them so they can move them, they can copy them, they can rotate them. Uh, and then here we're using a visual scripting system, which allows the user to set basically how long the player's got to complete the level. Once they're done, they can start to play the level at any time. And so you can see it's just a basic target shooting game. Uh, so we've got to shoot all the targets in a certain time limit. And you can see the participant here using full use of the environment and get the benefits of the passive haptics as well.
So we then developed a study to uh, evaluate this further. And so we're actually looking at two things in this. First, we want to explore the benefits of playing a game in substitutional reality over just VR. So we want to see is there an improved game experience? Is there a higher level of presence? Uh, and I just wanted to evaluate the user experience of using the uh, workflow from start to finish and to see if participants would um, accept it. So the study went as follows. So the participants played the game in both VR and SR, and we alternated which one the participants did first. Once done, they then captured the space using the meshing or the outline or, and the outline technique. And again, we alternated which one they used first. And once they had data, they then went into the VR headset uh, and then they could create their own substitution reality game level. So we'll look at the results of the game comparison first. So we can see here we're comparing the substitution reality version and the virtual version of the sample game that you just saw. And we use the game experience questionnaire for this. So you can see for the seven categories that the SR version scored better, um, but only sensory immersion, flow, challenge, and positive effect were uh, or showed significant differences. We then looked at the, the difference between the presence between the, the two versions uh, and so use the spatial presence and experience scale for this. Uh, and we see that for both the two categories and the total presence that the SR version uh, scored quite a bit higher than the VR version. Uh, and so there's significant difference here and um, very large effect sizes as well. <clears throat> we then presented the participants with um, some statements. Uh, and so you can see here that the substantial reality version, uh, participants found it more fun to play. They found it more engaging. Uh, they found like they had better presence with it. And it's also the version they would much prefer to play. Uh, then we looked at the um, workflow. So we evaluated the, uh, the workflow from start to finish. And to do this, we looked at the system usability scale. So we looked at meshing and the outline capture techniques separately. And we also looked at the, um, the VR editor as well. And so we can see that all of them scored higher than the mean of 68, which shows that it's uh, an accepted system. It's uh, a usable system. Um, we looked at the two meshing and outline separately. And we can see that actually, although there's no significant difference between them, Looking at the box plots, we can see that there was definitely a preference towards the meshing over the outline. Um, looking at the meshing and editor, we can see that they were rated good by the participants and the um, level day R outline was rated as okay. We then looked at the general feedback um, questionnaires. So uh, the first four questions were all about the VR editor. So we can see that the menu system, the prototype and geometry and model tools and the script and system all scored well. Um, and participants found them easy to use. Question five and six was all about the outline versus the um, LiDAR meshing system. And again, we can see that the, um, the LiDAR system was more preferred by participants. Um, and then the final section was looking at the uh, workflow in general. So we can see that um, participants found it, um, the, the data accurate enough to be able to play that game. Uh, they found the workflow easy to use. Um, they would like to use the system again. And they also found that the games and levels they created were fun and engaging. So in summary, the results suggest that there are original benefits to playing a game in SR over VR uh, with an improved game experience and higher levels of presence. The evaluation of the workflow was positive and shows that users were accepting of the workflow and systems. And going forward, we'll look at different genre games to see if the results are consistent. So, you know, is a horror game the same as um, some of the action game that we looked at? And we'd also like to evaluate the workflow in unseen on lab environments, such as participants' bedrooms, offices, and living rooms. So thanks for watching. Uh, thank you, Lee, for the presentation. Um, and we now come, oh, because I've seen quite a few people have joined. So this is obviously the session on haptics. I'm Stefan Lukos, the session chair, and we are now going forward to the fourth um, paper and fourth paper presentation in this session, which is on body warping versus change blindness remapping. Uh, it's a paper by Christian Patras, Mantas, Chibulkis, and Niels Christian Nielsen. And uh, it will be presented by Niels. The floor is yours, Niels. Yes, good. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, well, I guess now that we are thanking people, I should thank uh, Christian and Mantas for the two very talented master students that. I had the pleasure of supervising while they, well, they really did all the hard work. So, uh, well, enough about that. What did we do? Um, so it remains challenging to enable a realistic sense of touch in virtual environments. 
One promising approach, which we've already heard about, is to use physical prox, uh, props or haptic proxies as proxies for virtual objects. However, it's not trivial to rely on physical props as a source of haptic feedback in virtual reality, especially if the users are offered a high degree of freedom to interact with many different virtual objects. So in that case, it would be useful to be able to repurpose the same physical prop so that it can serve as a proxy for multiple virtual objects. Uh, as Mandian and colleagues proposed haptic retargeting a few years ago, which addresses this problem and makes it possible to repurpose the same physical prop as a proxy for multiple virtual objects. And out of the different approaches to haptic retargeting they proposed, um, body warping is probably the one that has garnered the most attention. So let's see, yeah. Uh, basically to ensure that the, the haptic proxy and the virtual object are touched simultaneously, body warping introduces an offset between the user's real and virtual hand as shown here. And for that reason, it seems likely that the noticeability uh, of this manipulation will increase as the distance between the virtual object and the haptic proxy becomes greater. It also seems likely that the offset between the real and the virtual hand may reduce the user's sense of embodiment towards the virtual body. So another uh, technique for achieving the same goal is change blindness remapping, which is heavily inspired by uh, um, Evan Suma Rosenberg's work on uh, redirect walking or impossible spaces, change blindness redirection to be specific. Um, and it's a different and less explored technique that masks the realignment of virtual objects and physical props by uh, leveraging change blindness. So essentially the idea is that um, the, it aligns virtual objects with haptic proxies whenever the virtual objects are not visible to the user, such as for example, when they're looking away. And because this technique does not involve manipulation of the user's virtual hands, uh, it should be less detrimental to the sense of embodiment. And because of change blindness, blindness it should also uh, remain um, imperceptibly, at least to, to some extent. So that brings me to uh, our user study, which uh, aimed at comparing the two techniques. We performed a within subject study with 20 participants and we compared, as I said, body warping and ch change blindness remapping. And we compared them in, term, uh, in terms of noticeability. So how likely were the participants to notice them and also embodiment. Uh, and during exposure to the two conditions, the participants were tasked with performing a very simple button pressing task. So they were seated in front of a table located on sort of a futuristic space station and on this table, they saw 24 red buttons, as you see here, and they were numbered and organized into four groups of six buttons. Um, then to complete the scenario, scenario, the participants had to click uh, the buttons one by one, and this process involved six steps. So first, they would uh, look upwards towards a virtual screen, which is highlighted in blue here, and this screen asked them to then afterwards look down on the table where there was a uh, an indicator uh, telling them when to, to go ahead with their next action. Uh, and they were waiting for this indicator to turn green. Once they did that, they directed their gaze at a screen to their right, highlighted with orange here. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, on that screen, they would then be able to see what button they had to, to press next. Um, then they would go ahead and press the button. And finally, they would direct their gaze towards the screen above them again. And on this screen, um, they would be presented a, a question, which I'll get back to in a little while. The physical environment included four circular buttons, which you see here, uh, and they served as proxies for the 24 virtual buttons. We used the Oculus Quest 2 to display the virtual environment and also to track the participants' hands. All remapping, so both uh, change blindness remapping and the body warping was performed horizontally. So the manipulation of the virtual objects and the user's hands was either left or rightward. Body warping was performed continuously while the participants were reaching for the virtual buttons and change blindness remapping was performed when the participants were reading the instructions on the screen to their right, telling them what button to, um, to, to click next. So they were effectively looking away. Uh, we performed the remapping at uh, six different distances. So zero centimeters, that's no remapping. And then at three, six, nine, 12, and 15 centimeters. They were exposed to a total of 48 trials. So that is two conditions uh, at six different distances. And each of these uh, combinations was re uh, repeated four times. To uh, quantify noticeability of the two techniques, we asked the participants to perform a two alternative force choice task every time they had clicked a button. And this task essentially required them to judge uh, whether or not uh, their hand or the environment was manipulated during each uh, button press. To measure virtual embodiment, we used the virtual embodiment questionnaire. Uh, and this questionnaire includes uh, three subscales. 
related to the extent to which the users experienced a sense of ownership of the virtual body, whether they experienced a sense of agency, agency over the virtual body, and whether they perceived a change in uh, body schema. So that brings me to the results. So what you see here on these two figures, that's the pooled response probabilities and standard errors across the participants and the fitted uh, psychometric uh, functions. And the detection uh, threshold associated with each psychometric function was defined as the remapping distance at which the participants were equally likely to respond that the manipulation had occurred or not on this uh, two alternative post-choice task. Uh, and as apparent from the dashed line here, um, on the two figures, you can see that the detection threshold uh, for the conditions, a uh, condition with body warping uh, was at a distance of 7.9 centimeters. And for the condition involving change blindness, blindness remapping, uh, the detection threshold was at 9.7 centimeters. So turning to the embodiment uh, results. So this figure shows the mean scores pertaining to the three uh, subscales of the virtual embodiment questionnaire. And as apparent here, you can see that the mean scores were higher for change blindness across all three uh, subscales. However, we only found a statistically significant difference with respect to agency and a marginally significant difference in relation to, uh, to ownership. So to very briefly conclude, the results uh, indicate that participants were unable to reliably detect the remapping of real and virtual objects at distances of up to 7.9 centimeters for body warping and up to 9.7 centimeters for change blindness remapping. So this may suggest that the users are less likely to notice change blindness remapping compared to body warping when the two techniques are used for, for this specific scenario. In terms of embodiment, uh, the results pertaining to the three factors uh, of embodiment gives us some indication that change blindness remapping may elicit a stronger sense of agency and possibly also ownership uh, compared to body warping. So even though, the, even though these findings are sort of somewhat preliminary in nature uh, and further studies are needed, we believe that they at least indicate that change blindness remapping, which has been explored far less, is a promising technique for repurposing haptic proxies for virtual reality. And thanks for listening, and I'm looking forward to discussing afterwards. Thank you very much for the presentation, Niels. Um, indeed, we move on to the next paper in this session, which is on let's meet and work it out, understanding and mitigating encounter type of haptic devices failure modes in VR. It's a paper by Elodie Puzbib and Jill Bailey, and uh, it's going to be presented by Elodie. Please, it's your floor. All right, um, kia ora. My name is Elodie Puzbib. I'm a postdoc at Henri Laren, and today I'll present a paper that we wrote with Gilles Bailly, CNS researcher from Sorbonne University, about understanding and mitigating unconscious type of haptic devices failure modes in VR. So first, let's start by defining the whole concept of unconscious type of haptic devices. Let's picture a potential interaction in VR with the user's bare hands and encumbered and free of any contraption. The user is free to interact with any of these three virtual teapots. In the real world, the user would ideally interact with the real teapot sharing similar properties as the virtual one. But what if the user were to interact with the second second green teapot. A conceptual robot would encounter the user with his desired teapot at the correct position. Here, the robot displays it at that second location. We've recently seen a huge burst of ETH designs of 3D various types, which I won't detail. Um, encounter type of haptic devices are conceptually really close to the ultimate display. And yet, while there are various implementations, they're still not deployed outside the lab. But why is that? Why, aren't there, um, why are there that many designs and why aren't these instances more deployed? Basically, because there's a lot of criteria to design them, many challenges, many limitations, and a real lack of guidelines. The aim of this paper is therefore to provide a groundwork for ETHD designers. We analyze and highlight the ETHD potential failures and define how to mitigate them to finally justify their lack of deployment beyond the prototype and actually encourage it. For this matter, we use the common approach from industry and quality control, the FMEA, a failure mode in effects analysis. Failure modes are ways in which the system might fail and effects analysis is the studying of their consequences. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Why? Being an ETHD designer myself, I aim to help others understand the challenges of these interfaces, their compromises, and define proper guidelines for unconscious type of haptic devices. How? Using the FMEA approach, we discuss all the strategies from the literature and therefore finally provide a survey of ETHDs. From the FMEA approach, we first identify the requirements of unconscious type of haptic devices. Let's draw a schematic of the ETHD scenario step. So first, we have an object of interest in the virtual environment, uh, which I will call OOI afterwards. Um, so then the user intends, like wants to interact with it. Then the ETHD will displace itself to physically overlay this object. The ETHD principle um, is to physically encounter the users to provide haptic feedback for the interaction to occur. But what if we have multiple OOI in a non deterministic scenario where the users are free to interact with any object of interest? Which one of these debots will be interacted with? We therefore need first to capture the user's intention, identify which object to overlay and predict it prior to interactions. So all failures and strategies associated to these requirements are detailed in the paper, but I will only focus here on the prediction resolution as an example. For instance, a failure in the algorithm resolution would result into the wrong object to be overlaid. A potential solution to mitigate this effect is to increase the number of interfaces by creating swarms of mobile platforms. So without having to predict intentions, robots can be in charge of overlaying each object within the user vicinity. This was instantiated in Zoomalls here, where the user's next interaction is captured and swarms of robots physically overlay the appropriate wall. Now let's assume that the OOI has been correctly picked. The user will then move towards it and the ETHD will therefore be required to physically encounter the user. This would require speed, accuracy, precision, and safety. So now let's give some examples of some failures and associated strategies from the literature. For the safety requirement, the main risk is to have the user and the interface colliding. Our first mitigation solution would be to split the user and ETHD workspace. And a second one would consist in notifying the users when the ETHD is in place and ready for interaction. Regarding speed, if the interface isn't fast enough, this would result in a special mismatch. The interface does not overlay its virtual counterpart because of its spatial position. A solution can be to add a delay mechanism when the user's speed is too fast so that they can slow down. We can know that this displacement success is typically a compromise with the user's intentional algorithm delay when one is applied in non deterministic scenarios. So this was instantiated here in Turdic where the participants could not cross the virtual environment because of a lack of a platform and fire sparkling below him. For speed and accuracy, many graphics techniques were employed where the user's trajectory is altered without the user noticing. So here, for instance, um, it is increased to let some time for the interface to reach the OOI position. So these types of techniques can even change the OOI position to tackle speed and accuracy limitations. More details are available in the paper. So now we've seen the intentions and then taken the displacement. Now let's focus on the final part of the ETHD definition, providing haptic feedback. So for the user's um, experience to be consistent, the robot is required to provide the appropriate haptic feature to the user during interaction. The ETHD is required to display adequate object properties and enable their associated exploratory procedures. Solutions to enhance visual haptic consistency and the rendering of various haptic features are proposed in detail in the paper. So we first decompose interactions with ETHD through three main steps, intentions, displacement, and interaction. We then used an FMEA approach to analyze ETHD's failures and highlighted strategies to mitigate them. The contributions of this work are a groundwork for ETHD designers towards the deployment of these interfaces. 
a novel framework for um, to analyze unconscious type of haptic devices, a survey of current unconscious type of haptic devices, and an overview of existing um, ETHD challenges and potential strategies to mitigate them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, really nice work. Like all the papers so far in this session, really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, the last presentation um, will be oh, where we are. Oh, what happened here? Uh, I'm sorry. So the last paper will be on exploring pseudo weight in augmented reality extended displays. Uh, it's a paper by Shohei Mori, Yuta Kato, Kataoka, and Satoshi Hashibushi. Um, unfortunately, Shohei Mori um, um, cannot attend the session. So for that reason, we will play um, his presentation from a pre-recorded video. Hello, everyone from Austria. I'm Shohei Mori from Graz University of Technology. Today, I'm going to talk about our work exploring suit weight in augmented reality extended displays. This work was a joint work with three researchers at different universities. Augmented reality enables virtual displays to extend the display areas and provide more helpful information than the solo device. This picture illustrates how an implementation of such displays could be. This is a virtual display anchored to the physical reference. This means it's only seen through an additional display device such as head mounted displays. That is, such virtual displays are private and free from physical materials. But today we are going to talk about its weight. You can find much literature on such virtual displays and find those implementations effective in terms of the performance in various tasks. However, none has discussed its weight, or more precisely, how we feel the weight even though virtual displays are physically weightless. So we are the first to investigate this aspect. When you look for literature on haptics, especially on weight sensation, you'll find much evidence on how the virtual uh, visual appearance of an object can change how we feel the weight of the thing. Size weight illusion is perhaps the most famous phenomenon we experience on a daily basis. Importantly, those weight illusions occur similarly in virtual reality and in augmented reality. What makes our dif ours different from the previous work is that our virtual displays do not change the device's appearance but they just follow the motion of the physical device the user holds. The motion of the visual stimulus also has an impact on weight, especially delays between the ideal motion and actual motion are known to have a relatively strong impact. We also investigate this regard. So, our research questions are do we feel the weight of the weightless virtual displays? And to find quantifiable factors and to clarify the relationship. In this study, we investigated two factors. The first is the layout and distance from the reference device the user holds. The second is the delay, as mentioned before. And we attempt to fit curves with the obtained samples to quantify the relationships between the perceived weight and those factors. We conducted two within subject studies. The users saw the world through a video see through head mount display to guarantee a file field view in augmented reality. Before starting the main experiment, Participants were trained to move the device regularly to ensure the suit weight in a common condition among participants. The participants repeatedly observed a reference, which is 100 in magnitude, and a stimulus in each trial, and reported the magnitude verbally. The top right figure shows what the participants saw in the experiments. The virtual the virtual stimulus was a uniformly colored virtual display mockup. To keep the tempo of the motion, 
replaced a metronome. In the first experiment, we randomly placed a virtual object at one of nine locations. The participants compared the device without an augmented reality disk uh, overlay and with an augmented reality overlay. In experiment 2, we designed artificial delays and randomly showed differently delayed virtual displays at either of the three locations indicated by the blue dot. This video shows how experiment, experiment 1 was conducted. The subsets of the augmented reality views show some of the locations given to the virtual visual stimulus. The score data were analyzed using a two-way ANOVA, with distance and direction factors. The main effect of the distance factor was significant, so the greater distance results in a lighter feeling. However, the main effect of the direction factor was not significant. We found the quadric, quadratic function fits the best for this result. This video shows how experiment 2 was conducted. The subsets of the augmented reality views show some of the given delays. The score data was analyzed using a two-way ANOVA again with delay and direction factors. The main effect of the delay factor was significant. So the longer delay induces a heavier feeling. However, the main effect of the direction factor was not significant. We found the sigmoid function fits the best for this result. So let me summarize our findings. We have found that distance and delay matter to the augmented reality extended display's weight. Also, we provide a way to design either lighter or heavier displays using the fitted curves. We actually see similar findings in other literature that investigated suit weight in augmented reality. Still, we find, uh, we find it interesting that the virtual displays float in the air and does not change the properties of the physical display itself. We observed that the controllable range of the weight is limited, but limited and saturated when given extensive distances or delays. From the user's comments, we consider that the weight might depend on how reasonably the user extends their body image when using the device with a virtual extension. Thank you for your attention. Um, well, thank you to all speakers in this session. Um, I would like to start the discussion section now, after we have seen all six paper presentations. Um, on, and I think I will go through the papers sequentially and then see how the discussion continues. Um, on the first paper, um, tapping with a handheld stick, um, I was wondering, that was a very abstract example, but would you see any future application scenarios where you would like to use um, yeah, the, the, the tapping stick extension uh, model? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, one most straightforward usage is uh, a fencing game. So you can okay. fight enemies uh, in a virtual game uh, with handheld stick, and you can get like haptic feedback from the fighting uh, the fightings instead of just uh, like fighting with air or something. Another yeah, another <laughs> another usage sure. Another usage is to simulate different kinds of uh, tools using redirection. So not only the stick. So I don't want to be a spoiler, but I think a very interesting uh, topic can be using redirection to simulate uh, hammers or swords from a single stick. Yes. And would you also see um, applications in, let's say, uh, standard interaction scenarios like selecting objects or moving objects around? Uh, have you thought mm -hmm. about that as well? I didn't think about that, but yes, I think that can be another um, application in the future. Sure. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the second paper, uh, Stroop. Um, We've received a few questions, and uh, one question by Pablo Figueira is on whether you can tell something about the movement range limitations of your device. Um, okay, so um, so um, in our study, the um, range of our VR rig were about, I think, uh, three times three meters. So, um, but uh, you don't have uh, some limitation in. Um, in a real range, so you can walk um, um, how long you want. So you have more limitation in, I would say, speed. So you, for example, cannot run uh, with screw. So uh, yet you cannot run, but uh, we are working to uh, improve the ergonomic design of screw so that uh, because some participants mentioned that it's uh, it's like wearing a skiing shoe, so you cannot, you have to get used to it. And some could work better because they were not that careful with it. So, um, um, other were some really careful and uh, were scared about destroying the device. So um, yeah, so there are some optimization about the design, for example, weight distribution because at the moment the uh, whole hardware is in the front of the shoe and we want to um, um, place something also at the back of the shoes that we have a better weight distribution and can better walk with the device. Okay. Um, another participant wondered whether, um, uh, well, yeah, you, your subjects were basically affected by, by the string, so did they relax during interactions or were they trying to keep the string on tension while they were interacting with the device? Okay, yeah, good question. So um, the string is always on tension because the motor is always giving a small um, torque so that there's a tension on the string. That's for, um, uh, for the reason that there's no latency when, it's, uh, when a person lifts and virtual object, but this force was about, I think, 80 grams that they feel um, for the string tension. Um, yes, yeah, so, and I think a HTC Vive controller is about, I don't know, 150, 200 grams. So, yeah, so that's, but yeah, we have to um, make some decisions with that we have a tension there. So we have to apply some forces. But in general, they were not complaining about that right no so were... i think no okay. um so no um none uh, participants mentioned that he feels constricted with the initial um, tension okay thank you um moving on to the next paper uh we got a few questions here as well um oh oh okay i understand the question so a question by michael bonford is uh, whether you can tell your um, design system whether you have furniture in the room that is not suitable for interaction, like the precious Ming ways, for example, that you don't <laughs> want to play with. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I guess you'd still use it in tandem with uh, the guidance system inside the headset. So the uh, you know parts of the room that you don't want the users to go to, you just wouldn't include in that system, um, and one of the benefits of using like the outline system is actually you get to pick which bits you want to include. So, you know, if there's parts of the room where you think there is furniture that's not suitable, uh, then yeah, you just wouldn't include it and you'd make sure your, um, the, uh, the guidance system, the guardian system just doesn't include those. Um, we would always recommend though that people don't put things in there that are potentially going to move. So you wouldn't put like an office chair, you wouldn't map it because it's going to move anyway. So it's more for kind of bigger, more kind of static um, furniture, you know, like beds and cupboards and tables and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, I think it's pretty important to guard your precious things. So <laughs> it's good to have that system in place. Daniel Case was wondering whether you um, have thought about workflows on how you could move uh, from one environment to the other, That's <coughs> if you have designed a level and how you could adapt that. And then, yeah, in so that, I was wondering whether you think in future um, we could have object recognition running and that 
basically automatically things are recognized and placed into a pre-created storyboard. I don't know, please, your thoughts. Yeah, so the initial kind of workflow was was actually for kind of user-generated content. So I kind of imagined, you know, you'd go around to your friend's house and you'd, you'd map a space and you'd have a bit of fun creating levels for each other. Um, but I could definitely see a system where, yeah, you could map a space and then you could procedurally generate stuff over the top of that. Um, yeah, that could easily be done, I guess. Um, alternatively, you could, well, the actual AR system basically just uploads the map to a web server. So the person who's making the level doesn't actually need to be there. Um, so you okay. could actually make levels remotely. Now, of course, you wouldn't want to do that for all of your customers <laughs> who bought your game. Um, but yeah. yeah, if you wanted to like make changes and stuff, you could do that remotely as well. Um, yeah. That's not so much of a problem. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, the, the kind of main vision really was about user-generated content and being in the space and being able to do it in situ. OK, thank you. Um... Moving to the next paper on body warping versus change blindness remapping. remapping. Um, uh, one question we got by Brett Jackson is whether, uh, well, he wonders whether the futuristic scenario that you were using um, had any um, impact on the um, way the users interacted within it. So do you think a more cluttered environment uh, would have been easier for them to detect relative changes? Yeah. No, um, that's a very good point and entirely possible. Uh, I, I, I don't know with the futuristic look whether that would have an influence uh, or not. Uh, what, I, what I can say is that for this particular study, we moved all the buttons um, and we deliberately chose physical buttons because they're not supposed to move around a table. Uh, and we also chose red buttons that would have sort of a high, they had a very high contrast to the table to essentially make it as easy as possible to notice any movement that might be going on. Uh, but I do think it's, it's correct. Yeah. If you had a table with a lot of objects on and all of them are shifted around, then it would probably be considerably easier to notice. With that said, I, I think it's worth noting that, that sort of the very first proof of concept we, we, we did on this we, was presented at We We Are, uh, the, the workshop a couple of years ago. And in that case, rather than shifting all the objects around, we just had pairs of objects where we were sort of moving them and switching them amongst each other, um, which seemed to work quite well. Um, and in that case, I could actually imagine that a very cluttered environment, so say you have a lot of tools on a table, then, then you might actually be less likely to notice the movement of a single object when you're not looking. Uh, but again, it, and again, it's also sort of assuming that you don't, you're not familiar with the placement of the objects. Um, um, so, but but uh, again, this is something that I'm very much hoping that we'll we'll sort of pursue in the future, or somebody else will try to figure out what are the things that actually affect people's ability to to notice this manipulation. And ultimately, I think combining techniques is probably the way to go. Yeah, I, I was wondering a bit. Like, is there anything positive that you can say about body warping based on your oh. results? <laughs> no, I'm a big fan of body warping. I think it's a, it's. A, I think it's a very, very neat technique. And I also think yeah. the fact that, that you can deploy body warping while uh, the user is looking at the objects they're manipulating, of course, makes it considerably more powerful. The, what I would like to say, though, is, is that, well, now, now Mar is not here today, but they published a paper some years ago where they did something somewhat similar, but where they were um, basically using eye tracking to estimate where people's visual attention was and then shifting objects around when you weren't looking at them. So it could be that this technique could be used uh, uh, even in view, um, but 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 at least right now we don't know if it will work. Uh, maybe if, maybe during blinks or cards, something like that. But I, again, we, we we don't know yet. Okay, thank you, Niels. Um, Elodie, um, I was I think it was a pretty cool study that you did. Um, I was wondering, so the ETHDs, if I understood correctly, at the moment they move around, so they move in the past of the users. Um, but, they are, but when they arrive, they are rather passive, right? What do you think uh, future ETHDs might entail? So might they be able to really interact or provide more multi-sensory cues to the users as well, like creating smells, winds, temperatures? I don't um, know. Well, I really hope so, actually. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, the ETHD, like for me, they were like, um, they're the closest thing to the ultimate display, you know? Um, cause like they let the users, um, unencumbered and it's like, and it's really easy to interact with them. And, 
And yeah, I believe that um, ETHD in the future, uh, they will still provide passive haptics, but um, in a reconfigurable way somehow. And, you know, maybe um, we'll tweak them with more um, IO capabilities, or <clears throat> sorry, vibrators or um, um, pulse cells so that we can have like all kind of haptic features stimulated. And that would be like really, really awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so actually, yeah. Sorry. Um, no, go. In the in my paper, because like in the presentation, I've I've um, talked about like three main steps of ETHD. Um, because for me, it's like intentions and then displacement and interaction. And there is like in a paper a second sub step to um, the displacement, which is also um, reconfiguration. So it's basically because um, for me, ETHD's principle is anchored in uh, robotic graphics, which is a paper from like the 90s. And in the robotic graphics, we, we had um, robotic shape displays, which are basically like robotized um, interface that would bring passive objects um, and robot cells that would be like interfaces reconfiguring themselves to simulate an object of interest. And so basically, yeah, for me, it's, um, yeah, the future of ETHD is a real combination of um, this displacement that is provided by robotic shape display and the reconfiguration of the robot cells. But um, they're analyzed as well in a paper if you want to check it out. <laughs> okay, will do. Um, <laughs> I would like to thank all speakers again for their presentation and for contributing to IEEE 2022. Um, thank you for being with us, sharing your thoughts and discussing your work. Um, this concludes the session on haptics, and I just would like to give an, an uh, well, head over to Bebella and look at the 3DI contest. There has been a fast forward this morning. There's really 14, um, no, there are quite a few nice, interesting 3DI contest contribution that you should look at. There's also voting going on for all participants so that we can identify a winner. And uh, if you've done that, or if you're not going to do that, there's also a uh, panel starting or has started by a minute ago on the future of this conference. So please consider joining there as well. Okay. Thank you for being with us and see you all soon again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, very cool ideas. See you. <laughs>